All right, welcome everyone. Uh, Northampton Urban Forestry Commission meeting, uh, October 19th, 2022. Thank you all for coming. Uh, we have some members of the public here. So if people are wanting to make public comment, now would be the time. Jackie, you're on, you're on mute, Jackie. That's all right. One more time. Yes, I All just right. wanted to say that I took the liberty of inviting some young people. Um, the local Sunrise Hub is very interested in this issue, but the representative had a conflict this afternoon. Okay. And the Northampton High School Environmental Club is also very interested. They're just getting their feet under them for this semester, but their teacher encouraged me to keep her and them informed. Um, yeah, so we got some young people behind us. I say us because I feel like I'm part of the family. <laughs> We're all part of the same family, but thank you. Um, anyone else from the public that would like to make a comment? Uh, Carol, welcome, you're on, you're on mute. Hi, everybody. Um, I just have a question about the, I think it's called, you're calling it, it's the STO, it's the ordinance that you've been working on. Is that something that the public can see yet, or is that still not being released to the public? Because I'd be interested in seeing it, if that's we, possible. Uh, typically, we don't respond to questions during the public comment, but I will just- Oh, sorry. No, no, it's fine. Um, we're about to approve a set of minutes that actually has the STO attached to it, the draft, okay. and that will be made public once it's published on the city's website after this meeting, once it's approved. Okay, thanks. I didn't know the rules about that. Yep, and you'll you'll yeah. see it um, as we discuss it, because we'll probably do a screen share um, during the, uh, the agenda, the, uh, the a lot of time on the agenda for-, for Okay, great. Thank you. Can I speak out of order and just say the current version is on the city website? Thank yep. you. Yep. All right. Any other comments from the public? I don't see anyone else raising their hand. All right. Fantastic. Um, okay. Thank you. Thank you for coming, everyone, again. Um, I sent you the amended, uh, the amended minutes, um, which you all should have gotten a copy yesterday. Did ever, uh, people didn't have a chance to read them, please do so. And then we will take a vote accordingly.
I'm all set. Me too. I finished too. I'm finished. Uh, who is still reading the minutes? I think it's just you, Rob. Well, I'm done. Thank you. All right. Uh, does anyone have any comments? I, I have two comments on the Andrew, it's page two, the Andrew Putnam section. Okay. The, uh, uh, the second bullet point in 2004, they had a tree study that showed the majority of the tree canopy was on private residential property. I thought those tree studies showed that the majority of the tree canopy loss was on private residential property. Mm -hmm. I could be wrong, but that's what I thought. Uh, David, I think it was both. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, that's where the trees are and that's where the loss is too, I think. Okay. Um, and then the other uh, comment is uh, the final bullet on page two, which says there were no legal issues as it was never challenged. I, I, I would say anticipating uh, legal challenges, the city was prepared to, uh, you know, green infrastructure, I, I gotta get that right, but there were never any legal challenges filed. Uh, Bonnie, were you able to capture that? Sort of. What would you like me to have it say? Anticipating legal challenge. Cambridge was prepared to consider trees okay. as part of their green infrastructure. Okay. Oops, so. On page three, um, oops, I lost my place. Oh, bullet three, discussion that city council will not like be not be likely to pass an amendment to the ordinance if public and private regulations are submitted separately. Um, maybe I didn't understand at the time, but I thought it was that the city council would, um, how would it be reworded? The city council would not be likely to pass an amendment to the ordinance if public and private regulations are submitted together rather than separately. Or maybe I misunderstood. I thought it was people were worried. I don't think it was a statement of fact. The way I understood it was people were, some folks were worried that if we don't just lump it all together, then they were unsure if, this, if the city council would uh, <clears throat> be likely to take up another, two separate things. 
like like it'd be worse if we submitted two separate things versus get this done and then I mean there was a little discussion about that it wasn't like a factual statement it was a concern that's what I remember but okay I I don't I'm not saying I'm correct <laughs> no I, I I think what Jen is expressing was expressed that there was a concern that putting them together um might or not putting them together might cause them never to take up the second one mm -hmm. but it was also expressed that there was a concern that if you put them together we might end up with nothing for the in other words if they're joined together we might get nothing so both both were concerned both those are two separate thoughts, the worry of if they're together and the worry if they're not together. So maybe discussion of um, advantages and disadvantages. Of having them together or of having, um, having of getting a city council approval. If, um, if public and private regulations are submitted separately versus together or something. Yes, yes. Just a, like there's a technical thing, but we're not talking about regulations. We're talking about an amendment to the ordinance, right? Correct. So like if, you know Okay. I mean? So what should regulations be instead, David? Where it says, should be oh. ordinance. We're, we're discussing ordinance. We're not discussing regulations. We don't right, make, right. We make recommendations. Well, we make recommendations on regulations, but we are working on an ordinance. So it might be it might be easy easier to just change the word separately to together, because the discussion was that if the ordinance is the the existing ordinance had an amendment to include private property that it the existing ordinance may not pass if they were lumped together that's just a suggestion maybe i'm off but that's how i am reading that so this, the, the discussion at the city council will uh not not likely get rid of the b not likely would, would not be or would not be likely to pass an amendment to the existing sto if public and private um if public and private trees or, or, or uh, public and private trees. Tree protections. Tree protections were submitted together. Something of that nature, because we're, we're basically saying that we're afraid if we're having discussion about this, whether or not the ordinance would pass separately, or if we decided to actually add a friendly amendment to it that also included private trees at this time that it would not pass. You know, I, I just, I don't need it in the minutes, but part of the thinking was that there had to be some uh, citizen groundwork to get the, right. the, the, the private trees included. They're just popping it up out of nowhere. It's not going right. to probably it's, not fly. It's too early. Yeah. Okay, so Bonnie, after all that diatribe we just <laughs> had, did you, were you able to like get something that you can wordsmith together for us yes i can do that all right thank you thank you thank you any other any other comments before i ask for a vote okay seeing none um we need a motion to accept the minutes as amended may i have a motion from someone i move to accept the minutes I'll second. Right. second. Yes, move to accept the minutes as amended. And Molly Hale seconded it. Um, any discussion on the motion? No discussion. Okay, great. Could uh, Bonnie, could you do a roll call, please? Absolutely. Rich? Uh, yes. Susan? Yes. Molly? Yes. Jen? Yes. Rob? Yes. And David. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, okay, I have a couple of things that I would like to just uh, talk to you about. One, I have a question for Molly. Molly, 
I know we talked in our, it's not on the agenda, but I just was double checking with you about that individual that was interested in becoming a member. Were you able to reach out to them? Um, yes, but then I forgot to do it again. Okay. Um, I'll have to write a note to myself to. Okay. About that, yeah. All right, and does anyone have any prospective folks that might be interested in being members? Anyone run across anyone? Anyone from the general public that's here would be interested in being a member. Think of that, folks, if you are interested. We have a lot of fun here. All right, uh, moving on. So two things I want to, two things I would like to share with you. One, I would like to um, applause for Sue Lofthouse. Uh, Sue gave a really nice presentation um, at the Western Mass Tree Wardens Center last Thursday in conjunction with Henry Lappin, the chair of the Amherst Tree Commission. Um, and um, basically, Henry uh, zoomed out uh, about um, 10,000 foot view items. So I would like to share with you the flyer that he that Amherst Tree Committee produced that I think would be something that we would like to um, help move along. Some of the things on here are interesting. Let me just do a screen share. Can everyone see that? Yep. Can you read it? Is it too big, too small? No, it's perfect. Okay, so this was um, Amherst Public Shade Tree Committee. So this, these are some of the bullet points that Henry spoke of, spoke about at the meeting, um, which was well attended. There were about 35 people there, uh, other tree wardens from other communities, tree care professionals, landscape professionals, a um, couple of professors from UMass. Uh, Department of Workforce Labor Standards. We always like to see those guys. They enforce OSHA rules on all of us, which is wonderful. Um, so anyways, on statewide tree issues, uh, chapter 87 update. So um, if you're not aware, and I will send you the language, there is a uh, chapter 87 update, which you know is the MGL 87 protects public shade trees in Massachusetts and trees on city parkland. So Amherst has been a proponent of updating this um, ordinance because it's so old. Um, was, I'm sorry, this uh, law because it was uh, adopted and passed on over 100 years ago. Um, science and industry standards have dramatically changed. Public shade trees are under much more stress, which is a very uh, true after summers like we've just had. Um, tree wardens need sophisticated skills and require, and require qualifications now which um, there are qualifications required for, for a municipal tree warden, depending upon the size of the municipality. Um, they require a, some level of college, uh, um, you know, higher education, and also a pesticide license, which is really managed by the Department of Food and Agriculture, which really has virtually almost nothing to do with what I do day to day in regards to being a tree warden. Um, and the fines that are spelled out in the existing uh, ordinance, uh, the existing law are um, no longer reflect the true cost of the trees. So um, the second uh, bullet point was the complete streets law. You know, trees are listed only as an afterthought in complete streets, which we've discussed many times. Require bike lane, bus, et cetera, leave no room for trees. Um, you know, we all support bikes, buses, and other movements of pedestrians. Um, um, but we need trees in our urban environment. Um, solar farms sitting, our uh, siding laws. Um, we've, you, we've all tackled this at one time or another on this commission in regards to the uh, ground mounted solar array ordinance that we helped craft with planning and sustainability. But um, I, I don't think it goes far enough. I don't think a lot of communities actually have the ground mounted solar array protections. Um, but I, I also think the state still relies upon old regulations from the 1980s in regards to solar siting. Uh, and now that solar is pretty, pretty big and a good sized component of our green energy that we get in uh, New England, I think it's going to be more loss of forest. Again, I think a really big 10,000 foot view problem, an issue, but really something that we should probably look into. Um, and then funding uh, for, for trees, there's also a house bill establishes a municipal reforestation program, seeks to quantify and protect urban trees for climate benefit and provides funding mechanisms for tree planting and care. 
Um, all of these, from what I understand, Sue, and you can correct me, but I think all of these individual bullet points, at least the first chapter 87 and the last one, funding for trees, which are all house bills, have the support of our local uh, uh, legislative contingent. Um, complete streets is a little different, but um, and so are the solar farm siding laws because they are so they're the solar farm is more in, uh, geared towards individual communities. On um, the complete streets law, is something that Mass DOT actually follows, and all construction standards actually um, start at the complete streets level. So that I, I will share this with you all. Um, I think this might be an interesting thing we can put on a, a future agenda. Um, if you have any suggestions or thoughts about what you'd like to talk about first, I think it would that would be great. The other thing I think it's really important for us to actually um, try to band together with other tree committees and have a roundtable discussion. So it would be interesting. Uh, it would be interesting to myself and Sue has expressed interest that it, uh, if we had a joint meeting and Henry has as well a joint meeting with Amherst Tree Committee uh, as, as a public roundtable discussion. On some of these topics, it might be helpful for us to to work together to to try to possibly change some of these things uh, or uh, you know uh, update them. So I think the only thing I'd add is um, yeah. he did stress that it's still good to reach out to the to our local delegation, our um, state senators and um, representatives to show support for these hmm. um they may be supportive but it's helpful anyway i think yep he did and, and i agree with that because i think it's important when state legislatures don't when they don't hear from us they think everything is okay even though things may not be okay um and, and i think this is these four topics right here are, are um impact every community in massachusetts so I think the loudest, the louder the voices are about maybe changing some of these and, and uh, creating updates for them actually is really important. And I think the only way we're gonna get this done is if we all work together from a grassroots effort from a tree committee or a tree commission or tree board effort and work with other communities. Cause a lot of most communities don't have a tree board that's, uh, that's like our tree board or like Amherst tree committee. Um, that meets twice a month and is as active as this, but I think that we we are um, we are very fortunate um, that we have the the um, this present um, setup. Yes, Molly. Is the Chapter eighty seven update something that's being actively worked on by the legislators, or something that Henry's hoping that we can get grassroots it, um, get it going from the grassroots? It, it's actively. It's been actively, it's in, it's a house bill that's in committee right now. And it's been there for like five years. Oh. It's been there for a long time. And the Mass Tree Wardens and Foresters, uh, some of the tree wardens uh, participated in a public hearing hmm. in front of the House Select Committee about this. And I will provide you with both information about both bills so you can actually just peruse it in your, at your leisure. Great. Okay. Uh, any other questions? can't see everybody so you'll have to speak up okay my next uh screen share is one other thing and then we can go on to the other topic uh carol you have your hand up i do but i don't know if i'm allowed to talk on that it's fine uh, go ahead okay um so th those bills you know they they didn't pass so they have to be reintroduced so they need new all that so you know that would be something that would be good to let like if the committee let the reps know and the senator know that the city supports that legislation being reintroduced and if they would sponsor it i believe they sponsored the last ones but you know continue um also there's a statewide group trying that that has been formed and meets you know every couple of weeks called uh trees as a public good and they're both looking at city and town, um, you know, forests and and trees, and you know, some people come to meetings who are working in their communities on getting tree ordinances passed. Like Newton um, is one that's active, and then you know, also talking about the protecting our state forests. 
is another another so it's like a two part group so I just wanted to let you know about that. Carol, what is the name of that working group again, please? It's called Trees as a Public Good. Okay. Is it Duke Carey Institute of Ecosystem no. Studies? No, it's just a group of I think our revolution started it, the group. Um so I'm but, not finding. Oh, I don't think they even have a website yet. It's a pretty new group just for the last I mean, I could send, I'll send Rich the uh, meeting notice. There's a meeting tomorrow night. Um, I don't know if anybody would want to go and they kind of vary, you know, I've gone to probably most of them, but you know, the focus kind of varies, but you might be interested. Th thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> so um, my last item is that uh, last Friday I participated in a street a tree steward training for DCR. Um, I gave a presentation on improving your community tree board, which um, at some point in time when we have some time, I'd like to actually give you a, 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 um, a PowerPoint presentation, a watered down one, because I had an hour and a hour and 15 minutes to speak. But I think it would be really interesting to see. I basically have taken our whole our whole initiative and I've made multiple PowerPoints regarding our initiative and spoken in different um, from different positions, so m mainly I speak from the position of the tree warden. But in reality, I'm I'm also the chair by default because I am the tree warden. But after really doing a whole bunch of looking at the work that I do as a tree warden, and then looking at what I what I've done as the chair of the commission with all of you, I really realized that the tree warden really is just the the tree warden is just the enforcement arm. You know, everything else that I do that all we all do as a group, we have very similar uh, work tasks, we have very similar 10,000 foot views. And so when I gave this presentation the other day, I was trying to give from the presentation and trying to get people to understand that um, it's much easier to actually work in collaboration with your with the tree warden and your local tree protection group or your uh, tree board or tree committee versus actually working in opposition, which is something that I personally experienced here prior, you know, many years ago, not while I was the tree warden, but in the early 2000s. Um, and so I based, basically, I had a 70, 70 uh, slide PowerPoint presentation that basically talked about everything that we've encountered, including uh, ordinances that we've drafted and worked on, and also included ongoing challenges. So hopefully my message got out, uh, our message got out, um, and I'm, I'm hoping to actually give a couple of uh, PowerPoints to a couple of the communities possibly. So I'm waiting for folks to reach out to me. There were about 25 people in this uh, tree steward training. It was one day, it was a one day training in Lemonster. So I stayed for the whole training. I, my presentation was in the beginning and I always like to stay because I like to listen to other presenters. So I learned something new. So I wanna share this with you because I think this is very cool. This just got rolled out by um, US Forest Service. And so let me just do a quick screen share again. Let's see. In here. No, that is not what you want. Hold on one second, sorry. I'll jump in and say that I have been to some meetings, there's a um, regional tree group, and then in some other capacities, talking to different towns. And it's not uncommon to have the tree committee pretty distanced from from the tree warden, and actually oppositional. So hmm. I don't. I think that that's too common. Uh, I, I I would agree with you. Let me just, I'm going to have to look it up because, hold on a second. Okay, so this, can everyone see this? Okay, so th this is a new, I don't know if anyone's seen this or not. This, this just got rolled out by um, the United States Forest Service. This is called Our Trees. So this is a, um, a web-based, web-based platform. You don't have to download anything from iTree, but this is part of the iTree suites that is web-based. So you can click get started here. It automatically defaults to Washington, DC. So I will put in here, uh, oh, which is 
Northampton. And then we come up as a community. And then it says over here, get results, right? So what this does is um, it must, you know, using LIDAR, which we were talking about in our last meeting, using LIDAR technology that the federal government has, um, it actually can tell us what our percent canopy is, which is very interesting. So here is our, here is our percent canopy. Um, we have a 58.68% tree canopy on 12,859 acres. It gives you the 8.61% the impervious surfaces over 1,800 acres. And total benefits, tree benefits for this one year for all that canopy is $2,890,124. Uh, so again, this is our trees. I'll send you a link to it. Um, you can actually scroll down and it gives you the annual values for one year. So you can see carbon dioxide uptake, you can see stormwater mitigation, air pollution removal, carbon monoxide, ozone, et cetera. Uh, Jen, you're, you're muted. There we go. Um, I just want to, I didn't, I've never seen this particular thing, but um, iTree Suites is, is amazing. If you, some of it's a little, takes a little more learning curve to, figure out, but there's these different tools. And um, one is called iTree MyTree that you can actually get this type of data in this. It, to me, it looks like a nutrition label for individual trees just by the DBH. Yep. Um, and there's other tools in, in this suite of tools. It's all free um, that you can figure out if you move trees closer to a building, how much energy savings and blah, blah, blah. So um, this is cool. I've never seen this, but if you ha ever have a little extra time to, there are some that are harder and some that are easier, but um, it's an amazing free, super powerful resource. Yeah, I found this to be really, really um, apropos to the conversation we had in our last meeting about really understanding what our um, percent of our tree canopy is. And we are, we are very fortunate to have 58%. Um, if you look down here in the bottom, um, carbon, so this is values up to date, carbon storage and CO2 equivalent is um, 656 tons so far to date and all that, the trees that we have. Um, and we basically sequester almost 11,000 tons a year of carbon. So just some very interesting data um, you can go over here to where it talks about the story. Um, you know, sequestering carbon as wood and trees counteracts CO2 emissions of about 7,743 gasoline powered passenger cars. So that's how much CO2 we sequester in one year. Um, and then it talks also about our community, which gives um, the uh, population which is based on the 2020 census, I believe. Um, and then there's all these other drop-down boxes, talks about medium income, homes, household types, et cetera. So really basic, but gives quite a bit of information. Rob. Uh, Rich, so we think this represents a reliable LIDAR analysis of our tree canopy. Is that? Yes, that yes. So, so we were very interested in our last meeting in having a longitudinal look at our tree canopy. So if we write this down this year and we just wait till next year, we'll, we'll have next year's, I mean, is this a, or can that's we look? Actually, that's actually a good question. Um, I mean, I believe this was done by what, um, Dave Loniars from US, US uh, Forest Service said that this was done by a LIDAR through satellite. Yeah. So I don't know how much, I don't know when their data collection timeframes are. So I don't know if they collect more data a year later. That's an email I can ask him. Because or, or even better, 10 years ago, five years yeah. ago, 10 years ago. I, yep. Yep. Then we'll have our answer as to whether we're gaining or losing tree canopy. Maybe, I think. I mean, am I right that that yep. might? Yep. I was thinking the same thing. Yep, me too. That would be wonderful. Yeah, that'd be amazing. Yeah, I wonder how, how recent this data is. Uh, 2021. Oh, okay. So I'm, so, just, I'm just giving you 
just a um, estimating benefits. Okay, so this is Boston. Their tree canopy is 16.96%, 17%. Rich, can you try Cambridge just because we were we were kind of sure. comparing ourselves to Cambridge yep. in some way in terms of our what we might do in terms of um, ordinance? Yep. I'm going to say 30%. Guess. Uh -huh. Wild guess. 16. Ooh. Uh oh. 16.21. Wow. Yep. S similar to Boston. Yeah. Yes. That's compelling. But you know, don't don't let the 58% that we have um, fool us in essence, because most of those trees are held on private lands. Mm -hmm. So you well, can actually you can actually go to iTree Design, um, and you can actually extrapolate. Um, in, so we could we could extrapolate individual parcels. So if you have a, a community that has a lot of lot a lot of parkland or a lot of private land that's held, you could extrapolate all that private area and really kind of understand how much um, how much tree cover we have that's owned by the city. It would take quite a bit of work. But it can be done because that was a question that came up in the tree steward training um, for another community that that has very low uh, tree density, but it's the the numbers are higher than the individual thinks because of the fact that there's a couple of large public parks that are actually owned by the state. So they they wanted to know how to back the numbers out so they could actually understand how much um, tree cover they had that was a true representation of what they owned. So on, on that point, I mean, we have, a, we have essentially a forest once you go past downtown Florence or somewhere out there. Um, yep. And so we're, it would really be more interesting to sort of see a ward by ward. And I suspect that these wards are, you know, I don't know, maybe. Uh, let me, let me, let me see if I can, I, uh, Dave Bonier, Dave Bonier has offered to help. So I, I'm going to reach out to him and see if we could actually break that down ward by ward for our next meeting, just so we can have some information. If I can get that done, it would be really interesting, actually. Yeah. And, so, and, and if you could ask him about the, if, if there's any data back. Yes. Yep. That okay. would be great. Thank you. You're welcome. What, amazing. Yeah, I thought it was, I thought it was pretty cool. So, I mean, that, that, that was worth me staying there the whole time. If I didn't learn anything else, this mm. would this was really great. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Um, anyone else have any questions? Okay, let me just close. All right, so we are a little, obviously, a little bit over. My apologies. Um, but I think we can make up the time somewhere else. So STO discussion. So I sent you all last late last week, the, or over the weekend, I think Sunday, Saturday, the STO original draft that we sent to planning sustainability back in the beginning of the summer. And then I also sent you the draft that um, I worked, the, our draft that I reworked with Carolyn in multiple meetings over the summer that we came to some final draft in the early September. <coughs> so, um, you know, it would be good to have some direction from all of you as to how you would like to proceed with the draft that came back from planning and sustainability. And I can do, a, I don't know if a screen share would be helpful or do people have it in front of them? I have them side by side in front of me. Okay, all right. So the one, the PDF, that's the more recent one, right? What does it say at the, what's the well, title? Okay, 12.3, yeah, 9-7-2022. Yes, that's and it should say CM. That means Carolyn Mish was the last editor. Ah, uh, oh yeah, okay. Oh, okay. So she's seen this since our last meeting? No, she has not seen this since, no. She hasn't, I have had no discussion okay. with her um, because we haven't, you know, in essence, we're like negotiating, okay. I suppose, but we, okay. we haven't had anything to bring back to her because we haven't, yeah, we haven't internally decided whether or not we right. like these changes to our original right. 
or do we want to make additions or do we yeah. just say, no, thank you. We want to stick with the original. Um, mm. So I'm having trouble finding one that says CM. I have um, one that says, uh, UFC STO draft final 518, 2022. That's not one of that's not right, right? Well, that that that's the one that we sent to planning and sustainability. Yep. And in that same email that I sent with uh, with the agenda, you will find that the 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 97 2022 it says RP draft. Oh yeah. Okay. I figured it out. 97 2022 dash CM edit. So that's the one that was edited by Carolyn and I over the summer. Hmm with the draft minutes. Yes, with the draft minutes that we just approved. I sent them as a package so everyone ha can compare them side side by side. <clears throat> okay, I'm, I'm just getting to it. I got it. I, I had seen it already. I forgot and I read them and forgot where they were. All right. Well, I'm trying to remember where we left off on our discussion of this last time. Um, what were the major sticking points that we were going over again? Were we still talking about the, the DBHs, right? And whether we wanted to accept the 20 inch, for example? I believe that was one of them. I think we spent quite a bit of time in our last meeting discussing um, the merits or, or um, of putting the potentially introducing a citywide tree ordinance along with this one. We had quite a bit of discussion about that. So, oh. but I, I think that we, you know, the main, the main changes really are the changes in the uh, district, the zoning districts where central business district core side yeah. are now 20 inches. Uh, and everything else is pretty much it remained the same. Although I, the URC, URB and URA were 12. And Carolyn asked to put them at 15. Mm. And I sent, yeah. you, I sent you quite a while back the zoning map that correlates with those. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I remember now the discussion we, we were talking about, we didn't, we weren't really crazy about the 20 inch and the 15 inch, and, um, or at least the 20 inch, I remember for sure. We were talking about whether we would send it back with like 18 on it instead of 20. <laughs> Something along those lines. We had said 12. Originally. And, yeah, it came back 20 for the downtown, for the central business. Yeah. A much bigger um, spread. Yeah. Much bigger incentives to develop downtown. Is her thought that there are a lot of trees in? that are above between 12 and 20, and it's a real game changer? Um, my understanding is, and David, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but my understanding is, is that the thinking would be that uh, if we lower the threshold below 20 inches, that it would end up capturing a lot of smaller trees, obviously, that potentially would create uh, some sort of financial hardship for, anyone that wants to develop any kind of uh, parcel that has to go in front of planning the planning board. So for example, um, I'll give you an example. If Rob or Jen, you have a side yard, right? Who has a side yard here? Jen yeah, does, right? yeah. Molly does too. So yeah. if Molly or, Molly or Jen want to develop their side yard, and I know Molly has a really large tree in her yard, a uh, big sugar maple. Right. Um, if you wanted to develop that and it was, and it could not be accomplished by by right construction, by the present infill zoning we have, you would have to go in front of the planning board. So if you were building an accessory apartment um, or some other structure that required review of the planning board and required um, a lot of trees to be removed and you were doing it for yourself, you, you still have to, every person has to follow the same process. 
So either a developer or a private person has to follow this process. So potentially, if someone was trying to build an accessory dwelling on their property, and they had to go in front of a planning board, and they had a whole backyard full of 15-inch trees, mm. it would be possibly a detractor for that particular one individual um, from actually building the accessory apartment to have you know one of their family members live in it, or they, maybe they're moving into it. So Carolyn's thought was um, really more so on, I, I think, from what I understood from her, was talking about the individual people that actually, um, individual homeowners that have to follow the STO mm -hmm. in this form. Um, it obviously applies to contractors and developers who are doing the same thing, um, but it that's the reason why. And you know, she wants to planning sustainability wants to encourage um smaller lot development in the center of town because they want basically people to use different modes of transportation they want them to actually walk ride their bike public transportation etc so that was i believe the main one of the main reasons so to be clear on this this um these diameters and this ordinance wouldn't even affect any of the um, development that's been going on in Bay State that people are so unhappy with, because that is by now considered by right, right? That is correct. Yeah. That is correct. And then for some example, if one of those um, presently under the ordinance, if there was any, uh, say there was work done yesterday and there were trees taken down on a what originally is a by right piece of property, and the developer later on down the line in the six months, 10 months, decided to go in front of planning board because he realized he or she needed special permit status. This STO would apply and they would have to abide by these regulations and pay mitigation for the trees that were lost. So it does capture, it does capture, that's the only thing that I can think of that it would capture that possibly was by work that was done on by right property, but ended up having to go in front of the planning board. But this ordinance in essence is only when there is site plan approval, special permit or zoning relief, like in front of the Zoning Board of Appeals, that is it. So the by right aspect of the type of work that's happening in Bay State and other parts of the city, this ordinance does not cover. Mm -hmm. So it's only if you're getting a variance from the normal um, regulations that apply to your zoning district. Correct. Yeah. Correct. Bridget, you know, what do you think? What do you? Sorry. Here, go ahead. No, go ahead. I'm what talking. do you think of the twenty-inch? You know, from being in the city for a long time, and you know what I mean. Like, I don't know. I really, I have a hard time with looking at it like a nineteen. And like when I when I'm uh, given these projects to look at. I, I, I have a, you know, from the planning board, when we've had these in the past, I have a tendency to go walk around with the DBH tape and just kind of make sure that everything's on the up and up. This is one of the reasons why, in part of this ordinance, while uh, we change the industry standards to reflect how you would like do an inventory or like how you would hire someone to do an inventory on your property. So it's easier for us to understand what we have, um, what we're potentially saving and what we're potentially losing. Um, I, I kind of, I just have a hard time. I mean, a 19 and a half inch tree or 19 and three quarter inch DBH tree, man, really provides the same services as a 20 inch tree. So, you know, if you had 20, 19 and a half inch trees and, and, you know, they're going to get cut down. Well, all those services that potentially if they were 20 inch trees would disappear. And a 20 inch tree is pretty, is a pretty substantial tree that provides, yeah. you know, a lot of services and then of course if it's a pine tree or if it's a conifer it provides services you know provides similar services but at a greater quantity um because of the mm -hmm. speed of growth because of the fact that it works 24 hours a day seven days a week 365 days a year um conifers don't require uh, conifers lose their needles every three years so they're not constantly using a ton of their energy reserves to re relief every single year um, so when I see pines being taken down, I really, I struggle with pines and spruces and things of that nature. I struggle with that because of the fact that they're, 
they're such a potent um, um, carbon scrubber and absorber um, and also big on stormwater uptake. So, I mean, I, I personally, personally, I think we should push back and, and, you know, mm -hmm. 17, 18. Yeah. yeah. You know, tw 20 inches, 20 inches is, is a, is a, is a large tree, you know, and the, and the unfortunate thing that I'd have to say too, is that these particular, this particular ordinance, like I said earlier, applies to individuals as well as developers, contractors. Um, so there has to be there has to be a little give and take because we we don't we don't we want to we want to do development but we want to do it smart development but we also want to protect the urban canopy that exists and developers in essence can can use the ordinance that exists today and they basically pass off all the costs to, to the person that's buying the property well if it's one of us or any one of these other folks on the on the Zoom call who have to build an accessory dwelling for their for their parent or for their their family or and they have to follow these zoning regs you know that may put an undue burden on them too if if the number if the dbh threshold is lower you know so there's that mm -hmm. there's, in that lens too and, I, and i'm not we're not in the business of deciding how much things should cost obviously we're in the business of deciding what we think is right for the city and in, in essence to protect the urban canopy but with understanding that there has to be, um, it has to be reasonable because it, it not only impacts the developers, but it impacts uh, individual homeowners that own property that have to go through this process. Rob, you're, you're muted, Rob. For one more time, Rob. No, I'm not, no, I'm probably not muted. Okay. Anyway, if I understood Andrew correctly, he was saying that, uh, Basically, long-term residents, um, the fee for the fees were reduced enormously um, for, for if you took down a tree, as opposed to someone moving in and that didn't live there and was developing a property. Do, does anyone else remember that? Yep. Yeah. So, so I mean, a way of handling that, the sort of the undue burden for someone who's trying to expand their house to make. A, accommodations for their family or whatever is to potentially do that. I'm not, I'm not recommending it or, or not recommending it. I'm just saying that Cambridge did have a solution, their solution for the problem. And uh, there they, they have a, a population that, you know, I, I was, I lived there for many, many years where people um, that they live there might, might not have paid a lot for their houses, but their houses have got, become uh, astronomically expensive. The, the least expensive house in Cambridge is over a million dollars at this point. So people, they feel people coming into the neighborhood can, can, can pay heavily for taking a tree down. That's actually an interesting concept uh, because uh, I'll give you another example. This ordinance that exists today, not this, the one that, uh, not the one in front of us, but the one that's actually embodied in the city ordinance was uh, had to be exercised for a um, accessory dwelling that was built on Lincoln, that was built on, on uh, Lincoln Avenue by um, an individual resident who was building an accessory apartment for uh, one of their family members. So, you know, it's just it's just interesting to see the other side of it because it's just not for it's just not for uh, developers. Um, we have a Eileen. Hello, you have your hand. Hello, up. hi. Um can you hear me? Yep, we can. Yep. Um, I'm a student from UMass. I've never been to one of these meetings before, um, so I'm just a little confused. Is the ordinance suggesting that if a tree is over like 19 and a half inches in width, then you have to go to the planning board first before you cut anything down? So the, the, the ordinance is designed to capture trees uh, on a project that has to have special permit or site plan review from the planning board. So presently the threshold is 20 inches. So if a tree is 20 inches or greater and it has to be removed, then the applicant, if the application is approved, has to receive a, um, permission from the planning board to remove the trees and there's mitigation uh, applied for that removal. So there is a payment in lieu or they have to plant new trees. But, but in this particular ordinance, we're suggesting that depending on the location of the 
property, that 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 requirement go all the way down to six inch trees, depending on the location. So it's 20 inch trees in the central business district, but in many other districts, it's as low as six inches. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Jen. David, what do you think of the, I'm kind of interested in this, um, in what Rob's, I had forgotten that Andrew said that about if you were an existing homeowner and were developing your property and theoretically gonna stay there um, versus a developer coming in, buying a property. Um, I'm kind of interested in that. What do you think about that as, like how could you incorporate it into what we've worked on so far? Or do you, do you think that's a good idea from a legal point of view? Or I'm just curious, David, what, what your take on it is. Uh, I, I mean, I feel fairly humble on this point, Jen. I don't really, I don't really know if that's, if, if, that, if, if you could do that. And I don't know how Cambridge has managed to do it. Because you're treating two different groups of people differently, kind of? Like it's not, yeah. yeah. That's right. Interesting. I'll throw another variant into the exception. Darcy last meeting suggested we look at the Palo, Palo Alto tree ordinance and they're at 15 and they give different preference for different tree types of trees. Mm. Mm. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, I just thought it was interesting. Um, it, it's they're based around water usage of the tree and nature. Hmm. It could possibly exempt Norway maples from everything yeah. that people have at them. <laughs> Susan, do, do, do you mean by water usage like that the, they play a more important role doing stormwater mitigation if there are certain species? I think it was that they use more water than... That's, um, that would be my guess. And also might be uh, like... The, I know like eucalyptus grows like crazy and that's a really fire hazard tree. So mm -hmm. that they may be like, yeah, Gary, you know, that's fine. You cut those bad boys down, you know? So that's, that's a guess, but, but I would guess it's the amount of water that those trees require to. Their ordinance actually has specific tree species that are protected and that um, native additional protected native tree species and all trees except high water users with a diameter breast height of 15 inches or greater. And Cambridge is 15, correct? I don't, I don't remember. Oh. No, Cambridge is, okay. I think it's six or eight throughout the whole. Oh, it's very low. sorry. Yeah. Hmm. Well, well, David, if I recall, there was a, like an emergency cap put on where you can't cut down anything over six or eight inches. And then they wrote an ordinance that might have been different than that. Is that right? They well, I think, yeah, there, so there was that emergency cap put on, I think that was eight inches, but yeah. I, think, I think now the tree protection ordinance, the trigger is six inches. Yeah, I don't remember. I could look oh, it up here. Sorry, I, I got mixed up on that. Six inches is a significant tree in. Yep, it's six inches, DB. And they have exceptional tree is greater than 30 inches. And their mitigation is broken all down into if it's a six inch tree. It's a different types of replacement than if it's <clears throat> you know different sizes of tree. You you mitigate very differently. Hmm. Which got, goes to way, Molly's points. They also had a way of people not paying a lot of money 
by planting some trees on their property. In other words, they made it clear that they're less interested in the money than in keeping trees on the property. So that would be a way potentially for a homeowner to escape large fees, just keep planting a few trees. Does everyone remember? I hope you all remember that. That's yeah, it. I've been thinking yeah. about that since he talked about it, about how do you move it from a, a payout, an expense right. to a growing the canopy, which is our ultimate goal. Yeah. Right. But especially because we're in this position where, especially in the in the more urban or more urban neighborhoods, we have enough money to plant most of the places that are available to us to plant, the DPW does, but we don't have the available soil volume because it's mostly on private property. So really the, the goal, I would think even it, not to complicate the current SDO that we've written, but the goal is really not to, not to find people. I mean, finding people gets some money, but getting them to put trees on their property would seem like a really even more important goal. And so- Couldn't they put on their neighbor's property in Cambridge? That's right, they could plant it. I think there was some restriction as to how far away it could be, but yeah, there was some sort of like somewhere in the neighborhood plant a tree on, yeah. Jen, hi. Um, I, I just am so torn. I go back and forth about this in my mind personally, you know, about in, you know, infill, let's keep it walkable, stuff like that. Um, but I just had this thought now, um, you know, the reality is those trees that are in the urban core that are 20 inches or above have been there before the amount of impervious pavement. Mm. They were established long ago, you know? So maybe when the street was cobblestone or something like that, where there was a lot more air penetration, a lot more water penetration. So the reality is, um, you know, losing a 20 plus inch tree, I wonder if you'd ever get a 20 plus inch tree back, you know, down the road, unless you had, you know, you know, some type of, I don't know, planted at Jackson Street or something where there's a big lawn or something. You know, I, I, I don't know. It's just, it just went in my head. I don't know what, you know, where to put all that. But, um, you know, I think there is just generally an attitude of, well, we'll cut this big tree down and then plant six in its place or something. And, um, you know, that there's that huge tree, I carry a tulip tree, is it maybe up in Florence or something? Like, like that tree was here probably when that darn road was dirt or gravel, you know, mm -hmm. which is a whole different situation. And with the sidewalks we have to put in, uh, concern about ADA compliance, which is all good, you know. It's, uh, I don't know, for what that's worth, I just thought of that now. It's, Dude, uh, we have an exceptional tree category. That's what you're going to, because there were... Yeah. There's been other trees, sycamores, um, down where the old Mill River used to be, behind Pleasant Street in that gully behind um, Wilson. Huge trees, and that really pained, you know, all of us to see those trees by right. They're gone. Mm -hmm. Yep, um, Jen, you bring up a good point. The average urban tree's lifespan is between 19 and 28 years. Mm. In today's world, wow, wow, so you are correct. A lot of the large mature trees that have been removed have been there for a very long time over 100, 100, 100 years. <laughs> and most of the trees that are large in that size definitely uh, were they lived in a place where there was, n you know, there was in, um, in not uh, impervious surface. So, I mean, even the street trees on Main Street, for example, that don't exist anymore downtown, were all elms that were planted in the road, you know, and then as as we became more mechanized and you know needed to walk on sidewalks instead of walking in the dirt, we changed the landscape, and you know this is where we are today, um, which is which is unfortunate. I also want to say that I don't think there's any reason why we we couldn't make a friendly amendment to 
the ordinance um, in regards to uh, what we were talking about having sort of defining the difference between a resident actually going in front of the planning board and requesting um, you know, a special permit or site plan review versus a developer. I think there's some merit to that because um, yeah. we, we've made, we've, We've made friendly amendments in here before. For example, um, one of the newest friendly amendments is um, on page, the second page of the SDO, um, where it says fossil fuel free for all electric and thermal loads. You know, so that is a friendly um, that is a friendly amendment. It doesn't particularly apply to any individual people versus developer versus um, resident, but I think that it would be it's possible that we we could actually create a um, sliding scale for tree replacement based upon the yeah. applicant. If the applicant is has lived in the home for a next a period amount of time, or is the applicant is um, just building three houses and going to sell them, then the sliding the scale would apply differently uh, because it would encourage. Yeah, it, it would encourage. It, it wouldn't penalize. It wouldn't penalize residents. Um, to, to the point where it would maybe make their projects, um, you know, um, unreachable or, un or, or not affordable. Developers, unfortunately, you know, th they pass on all their costs to the, the buyer. And the other thing, the other reality too, is that we live in a world now that housing is in such demand, it's, it's absolutely insane. You know, we have a real, not only do we have a tree problem, we have a housing problem. Mm -hmm. and, and thus, this is why, you know, we've, kick this can for a better term down the road quite a bit in our short tenure as a commission many times. Um, but that is something that I think that's interesting to me because really it's app, right now it's apples to apples for tree replacement. Maybe it shouldn't be apples to apples. Maybe mm -hmm. it should be apples to oranges, you know, and our developers held to a different standard. And, and I know that may seem unfair to the developers, but I also think there is some levity or some fairness that for residents that want to stay in this community that want to build accessory apartments or something right. that, that that they can afford to stay here and do this without being completely priced out. I, I don't know. I don't know what that language would look like, but I'm willing I, to, to look into yeah. it for Cambridge to see how it works for them. I like that. And again, I, David, you're right. I don't know if there's legal ramifications if this wouldn't pass the sniff test with the city solicitor, but I mean, it doesn't hurt to ask. I like that. And I also, um, I would also be inclined to lower the 20 down to 18. Okay. Because of what we were talking about, about how it's, um, once those big trees go in the urban court, they're never going to come back again. We're never going to get they're all the more valuable because once they go, they're never going to, we're never going to get them again. So it's sort of like those at the same time with the planning board would argue that, well, the, the core area is the, is the most important one to allow development on. But at the same time, the trees in that core area are the ones that are the most valuable because they're never going to come back and they're providing shade in an area that desperately needs it. Yeah, I mean, it, it makes it, it makes complete it makes complete sense to me. Um, you know, and I also think going back to what I said, the segue of actually asking for a sliding scale for replacement. I think I don't think this ordinance in its present iteration, not the one we're working on, but well, maybe the one we're working on, doesn't really um, it doesn't foster it doesn't really emphasize it emphasizes the importance of trees in the very beginning, but then it doesn't really it basically says, you know what, it is what it is. If you're planning on cutting all these trees down in this district, then, you know, you just got to pay us cash, right? right? It, it doesn't, it doesn't encourage tree planting. Um, what would encourage tree planting, I think, going back to the sliding scale aspect, if actually we're doing this and we change the replacement schedule based upon the residency of individuals, mm. it actually 
might be, it might make a segue into potentially working on and crafting an ordinance similar to Cambridge to protect all trees or, or require tree permitting like Cambridge, where again, there is a whole replacement scale that slides um, to encourage people to plant on their property. I mean, don't, don't get me wrong. I'm, it's not the, I don't, the money is put to good use for tree replacements, but I'd much rather see people plant the appropriate tree back on their property, whether it's through um, using this, you know, this for uh, site plan approval for a large project or site plan approval for an accessory apartment at this on the side of Molly's house, you know, just using you as an example, Molly, just because of your sugar maple. But yeah, well, also there's limited. Oh, I'm sorry, Jen, you've got your hand up. Uh, I just, I just have a, a question, Rich. Um, yes. So let's say we did rework this STO and there was a you know, there was a large tree on a private property. And um, do you feel like we have enough uh, with those large trees or even one that's um, in jeopardy in downtown area or something? Um, do you feel like the tree protection stuff we have is would adequately protect those large trees? in a construction event? You know what I'm trying to say? Uh, yes, and the answer to the question is yes and no, because it depends upon the scale of the project. Um, typically the work that I've done with developers, they are more interested in actually just building the building and the tree is just like a sign. You know, They can just pull the sign out and stick it back in when they're done. Mm -hmm. uh, and in order to actually really uh, enforce tree protection measures, you know, I, I have to work yes. with the individual contractor or developer or them hiring a certified arborist to actually provide that information is helpful. But again, don't forget the certified arborist works for the client. Right. So if the developer doesn't want the trees, the certified arborist, hopefully would he would not or she would not do this, but they would say that, well, these trees are uh, pose a high risk for failure or they have these defects and thus we would like them removed so they would end up paying into the fund but again that sliding scale of having a developer pay x and then having a homeowner pay x but we actually we were going to give them a discount because we want them to plant instead mm -hmm. is could also work in our in our favor but again i don't know if planning and sustainability would be willing to split that up because I can remember having a conversation with them about infill development and et cetera, about how you know they felt it was, it should be, they were, they were interested in actually looking at a tree protection ordinance for the whole city, but they also recognized the fact that it would be, um, that, that it would impact everyone, it would impact. So you, if you have the same standard for everyone, if it was a, a, just a resident um, or just a, a contractor, a contractor has much deeper pockets than an individual resident who's trying to build a, a, a building. So they were hesitant to do that. So this is kind of how this came out, I think, mm -hmm. um, through multiple iterations. Mm. Well, anyone else have thoughts, suggestions? There's so much more work that could be done on this. It just feels like we never have enough time in the meetings to really, you know, do what, you know, to discuss it and flesh it out the way it needs to be. Um, I mean, you know, the other thing we could do too is that we could, we could just add this to another meeting and we can garner more information. We could also reconstitute the subgroup that we had that worked on this. Um, to bring back another iteration if that's what the commission chooses to do. I'm willing to work, I'm willing to do whatever you'd like to. Maybe that makes sense. Yeah, maybe point. so. Because yeah, it just seems like um, there's all these ideas like, like different species, you know, or different rates for different people versus developers. Um, and then I'm seeing, I am trying to toggle and look at Cambridge and they have like, there's the city's residential property tax exemptions and like people on foods, 
you know, they have a whole list of people who are totally exempt from this. So there's got to be a way, but unless we're actually having like a full hour to talk about it, I don't see how, like Molly's saying, there's so many different things. It's hard in one meeting. Yeah, I would like to see the committee. I mean, I think there's maybe three or four core things that we're wrestling with here. And um, I think a reconstituting re of that subgroup to work on it would be, and maybe come up with two or three options if we go this way, if we go this way, you know, and then we, we could discuss it and possibly get to a, to a decision. But I would favor the, the subgroup just because the history is already there of working on it. Jen, uh, let me just pick your brain for a minute. What what are the the issues that you're, that you're stuck on? Just so I can we go ahead. Well, one I it, one is I think uh, thinking about the you know the chart. So, and then the other one was about um, about. Uh, whether having separate, um, separate, I don't know, I don't want to use the word penalty, your separate uh, requirements uh, for a homeowner who is going to stay. Like an exemption. Yeah, kind of, mm -hmm. and versus a developer. I'm not a fan of the species because I just think that's going to get too, I, I just think it's going to be too much, I, I think people's eyes are going to roll back in their head and they're going to really oh, get sorry it. I brought that <laughs> no 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 I think for California I get why they because they're trying to change their landscape you know and uh what was the other one we were just talking about um shoot. exceptional trees yes exceptional like a category trees. for those trees that we're never going to have again right exceptional trees yeah so I think those are the three ones, unless somebody else can chime in. If there's there, another. there was also uh, incentivizing people to plant trees by sort of tinkering with the Cambridge formula. Mm -hmm. Having that as an overarching goal. Yeah, I'd say it's basically trading people saying, okay, we're not gonna charge you a fee if you make your land accessible to us to grow trees. And so being someone who's out there trying to site trees all the time, Mm. that land is worth more than the tree to us in other words that because we're, we're right we we need people to give us their their lot to plant on to succeed yeah it doesn't matter if it's in the front by the sidewalk or well it does for walking people but yeah it's better in the front but just plain old just to get the tree canopy going in, yeah. in the city because i mean every time it's just lawn there's really very little you know as i approach a neighborhood or a street they can have all lawns all over the place and um there's not a lot of ways of fixing it without them saying here have some have my soil plant here and that would incentivize them and sometimes the front there's wires so if you're thinking yeah. canopy wise yeah side or back might be a desirable yeah. too it's yeah, the was, soil volume we want there's limited good places in the public right-of-way especially yeah. a lot of them have already been planted and there there aren't that many you know good spots left where trees can grow really big yeah it's exactly and so but there are a lot of lawns still yeah a lot a lot of lawns yeah. um carol has her hand up carol Hi, I'm here. I just want to um, start my video. Sorry. Um, so I want to know, um, sorry, the chat's not enabled or I would just ask, you know, questions that you could answer later. But um, I wonder how the public can be involved in this. Like, you know, you're going to have a subcommittee. And I mean, I, I know I have a lot of things I would say. I don't want to say them in the meeting because I'm not on the commission, but um, you should join. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, I'm thinking that 
I don't know. You you guys know so much more, I, especially about regulations and everything. I I would be way behind. But anyway, I would think about that. But um, just anyway, how can the public be more involved? Because there's there's a bunch of people here, and we can't really you know participate with you know. I don't blame you, but um, how can is there a way that we could get involved in this? So what I, what I would what I would recommend. Go ahead, Rob. I'll let you go ahead, Rob. Yeah, I mean, uh, just off the top of my head, I, I think the ordinance is, is attached to our minutes, which means they're public, right? That as as yep. written. Yeah. So, and you've heard the discussion. Yeah. I don't think there's anything stopping you from reviewing the ordinance and then um, editing it and sending it back to us for our next meeting. Is, is that okay. right, Rick? Yep. Yep. So, so okay. Uh, yeah. Gonna, these minutes will be posted. I'm going to get them posted. I hope tomorrow or the day the next day. Great. Get the the draft ordinance. That we mm -hmm. have it's on the minutes, and then you can go to the e code three hundred and sixty, and type in the ordinance number, and you'll see the existing ordinance, and you can compare the two. What the do other, I do to, to see the existing ordinance? Sorry. Uh, e code. E, just type in e code three hundred and sixty Northampton. Okay. And then type in the uh, I think it's uh, twelve point three. Yeah, three fifty dash twelve point three. It's E C O D E. Yeah, e -code. not E C O. E code. code. I got yeah. it. Sixteen yeah. Northampton. Okay, I'll call you if I can't find it. Or yep. you call me. Send me an email. Um, so okay. folks participate by basically sending, looking at the minutes, reading the existing ordinance. They can also participate by sending, uh, sending me an email, mm -hmm. comments, questions, concerns. Um, and then you are more than uh, welcome to attend a subgroup meeting. Those will be posted just like a public meeting because they everything we talk about here has to be vetted in public. Mm -hmm. So you can participate in that way. And those are a little more, I guess, we could say they're working meetings, but they're a little less formal than, you know. So I mean, obviously, everyone here, all of us have a vested interest in getting this right. So we are. Um, I'm excited about having input from the general public. Okay. I have one more. Yeah. Rob, that, um, yes, Rob. I don't really want to participate in because I'm very busy, but um, and I might be wrong about the, the um, whether it's even a good idea. But um, I think that there's nothing. Speaking to individual members of the Urban Forestry Commission, as long as there aren't other members there, I think is also permissible outside the meetings. Is that right, Rich? Uh, it, you can have a one-way dialogue with someone, um, but you have to be careful if there's two commissioners or more talking about subject material that actually may come up to a vote in a meeting. So but, it's but, great. but if there's only one commissioner, you can have a two-way discussion, can't you? Yes, you can, but it would be easier for people to direct their comments or concerns in a single email to me, and then I can share them with the commission. Just because I I um, I don't want to violate open meeting law accidentally. That's all. Okay. I'm just sort of sorry. I'm sort. I guess I'm sort of a I guess a originalist or a ritualist when it comes to Robert's rules. But I just want to make sure we're doing it right. Yeah. Um. um Rich, something that would be helpful for me would be. Um, do you think you could get? Um, I have a GIS program that I use. You know, to look at aerial photos and I use it for doing the Alantha surveys and so on. Um, but I don't think I can get through MassGIS the Northampton's zoning maps, um, but they must be, I'm sure they must be on GIS within the city. Yep. Is that something you could get so that I could get that layer and look at it on my GIS and overlay it? I wanna see where the CB district is. Okay. And like, look, actually go there and try to find where are the big trees. Um, yeah, let me see what I can do. Okay, great. I think that'd be great if you did that, Molly, because it'd be really important to know whether we're talking about theoretical or actual trees. Exactly, right. That's what I just want to know. Like, are we talking like two trees or no trees or 20 trees or what? Yeah, so, yeah. So there is there is the public file cabinet um, yeah. in planning and sustainability. Um, you might be able to access a like a static map Huh. Well, I, I'm looking at the zoning maps now, um, but without seeing them overlaid on top of 
like say an aerial photograph, it's hard to know exactly where those are. Yep. Okay, let, let me see if there is something that exists. Yeah, I might be able to get you something that's static that would be like transparent. So you can yeah. see that, that I don't I don't think that uh, we're allowed to share the live the live links to our internal GIS because of Homeland Security issues. So what do you mean? So static, I'm not sure what you mean. So yeah. a, a static would a static would, right. So you can't edit it. You you would that's just basically get it in like a, like a PDF form. Oh, just, you just yeah, that doesn't really work. Yeah. But um, but if I get like Mass GIS has layers that are open to the public that um, you can't edit. Yeah, just let me it. let me ask our GIS uh, Karen, our internal GIS person, and see what she comes up with. Okay, great. Okay, so we have just to recap. We have two minutes left. We would like to start the subgroup, so that means that Sue and David and I were the original subgroup members. Are David and Sue still interested in doing the subgroup mem subgroup meeting? Uh, yes, preferably in person. Yeah. yeah. Preferably in person. Okay, so I just want to, I just would like to remind you though, in person is going to make it a little more difficult for folks that want to attend the meetings because of the fact of time constraints, etc. So I'm just and thinking. I about, guess I would say I'm willing to do it unless there's somebody else who wants to do it. I don't want to exclude anybody else. I don't know if there's a limit. <laughs> and, and I would suggest, unfortunately, the Zoom would be inclusive to get people like Carol who have a strong interest and want to be involved. Yes, I do. So I we can do. build more of a grassroots Maximum involvement. It's true. Um, we want as many people as possible to be paying attention to this and speak it up. And then I have the four, um, the DBH chart is one of them. Um, the uh, sliding, um, the separate requirements for a property owner that's going to live in Northampton versus a developer or an exemption. Um, category of exceptional trees um, and incentivized tree planting. Those are the yeah. four items that I got. Okay. All right. So I will send an email to Sue and David um, and we'll try to pick a time when it's convenient when we can meet. Um, and you can get back to me individually. And then I'll publish a uh, I will publish the meeting. Okay. And if a citizen was interested, they would just look at the city website periodically to see yes. when the meeting okay i just yes. want to offer that I they would go under urban forestry commission and this subgroup is a working group of their commission because we've met in the past if anybody has any questions that are in the public in this meeting you can also send me an email i can try to keep you as updated as i possibly can although i i sorry if i'm slow on the emails I've been kind of busy uh sue you're muted so oh. I just want to jump in and say that if you just Google city of Northampton tree ordinance, it will get you really close. And that whole e-code place has a really good search. So you should be able to find it without having to have that long address that we were talking about. Okay. Any other questions, comments? Thank you guys, you three for being willing to form a new uh, committee again. Anybody else want to do it? I'm semi-interested, but I might be able to do stuff sort of related to it, but not actually beyond the committee. Would people think. be allowed to come, Rich, if we let people know when it is? Nope. It's okay yeah, if I mean, there's I'm a not, forum. You know, I, 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 going back to what David said, I like David's suggestion about making it in person because I find that working, working on something like this in person, I think you're yeah. really successful. But okay, I, but but a I'm not sure that everyone that would like to participate can, um, because of time constraints. That's the one thing I like about Zoom is that we can all sort of participate from different places, and so we do give a little bit in our ability to work um, more intimately in essence and getting crafting language like this. But I also think that it's possible to do it and try to get maximum public input. So, I mean, we could do one meeting by Zoom if we don't feel like it's working, 
then we could just post a meeting for a location where we could actually how you know we could get six or seven people that could actually be in a room together i mean the other thing too obviously is COVID is still out there people have to be you know um considerate of that um and i also have to find a place where we can actually um, have the meeting taped that's the other thing oh. so being on zoom is helpful because folks that can't make it can actually review our recordings um that's true which is helpful so um okay all right so i'll email sue and david and molly i'll email you as well and the cc just so you know kind of what's going on and if you feel like you can pop your head into a okay great um okay we have a couple of things left on the agenda jackie balance quick question yeah. hello jackie um, you might try a hybrid meeting. Some people can meet together and one person can be on a Zoom and include people at, who are remote. Just an idea. I'm done. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Jackie. Thank you. Uh, so fall planting. Yeah, I have a, a comment about fall planting. I, uh, Rich and I have put together a sort of a projection loosely of what we'll be doing. We've never, we know often don't have a kind of schedule. And if I could, I just really, I can read through it in a, in a minute, uh, less 30 seconds. So uh, on, uh, this Saturday, we're gonna be at Jackson Street School. Uh, the the uh, next, the, 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 the coming Wednesday, we'll be at Bridge Street Cemetery. Uh, hopefully Saturday the 29th, we'll be at Warfield Place. Uh, then on November 2nd, we're planting a group of trees on Howes Street. On November 5th, we're planting a group of trees on Middle Street. And on November 9th, a group of trees on Meadow Street. It, it, it's not exclusive or fixed, but it just gives you an idea of where we'll be and where we're planting in, um, on, those, on those places, groups of trees. Is that information on the um, Tree Northampton website? No, definitely not. not. Hmm. Because it... It changes it, it, quite quickly because, um, for instance, we have reached out to the Jackson Street. Well, David has reached out to the Jackson Street School principal just to get assurance that it's okay to be there. And so, if it's mm -hmm. not, we'll shift to a different place. The Bridge Street Cemetery is dependent on Rich doing. A, Rich and I have worked on this, and he has a, 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 he has to do a little more research before it, we can plant there. And so, if he doesn't get it done, we won't be planting there. Oh. Warfield Place depends on the delivery of some trees on time, mm. and whether they'll be delivered on time or not, we don't know, and so on down the list. So all of these depend on people getting certain things done, giving approvals, trees being available. You said, so, so this Saturday is Jackson Street School, and yep. the, next, the next one after that, is that the Bridge Street Cemetery? So Wednesday, Wednesday, <laughs> Wednesday August 26th is the Bridge Street Cemetery. I can send you, I think I was included in that email. So I could, oh, send, yeah. I could send it to you, Molly. Good, because oh, I know a person in Amherst who likes to come over and help out with the tree planting. Oh, I, I'd be glad to share it with, with anybody, but, but before anyone actually goes to these places and thinks we're gonna be planting, okay. they need to get into the email, the, our regular email um, notices. Oh, how do you, well, I need, so this person needs to be on that Tree list. Northampton. Yeah, oh. Sign up to be a volunteer planter at Tree Northampton. Oh, okay, no, okay. It's org, actually. Sorry. Yeah, because we're very worried that if we post that stuff ahead of time too far, that um, people will just show up there and then won't. Okay. All right, fine. Now I know how to. Let's it's also a matter of like sometimes it changes at the last minute, sometimes weather can change it. Yeah. Sometimes. Um, you know, we're working it. really okay. hard to have the right number of people yes. so that we have enough people or okay. not too many. But oh. Molly, if you're trying to get your friend uh, like in, in this right away, um, sometimes um, including if it's on a Saturday, just let Vicki know about this. Mm. And if it's on a, um, if it's on a Wednesday, let me know about it. Oh, okay. Or, or Jen, because that way we can make sure that they get in this chain in, in a timely way. Okay. 
so Jen and I are kind of um, have some interest in Wednesday and and Vicky on in Saturday. Okay. But we all cover it for each other. Um. Okay. Um. We're going to table, I guess, the uh, spider lanternfly strategies. We don't have time to talk about that. Molly, we'll sorry, we'll we'll get there. No, um, we won't. <laughs> any other business not anticipated by the chair. Unless you want to talk about it now. Let me just say something. I wonder, um, Jen, let me ask you. Would you be interested in getting together to brainstorm uh, modes of communication? What, like, what needs to be communicated and to whom? And maybe just like think about how we might do that or what, what's needed? Sure. OK. Does that have to be a public meeting, Rich? Or can two of us just get together to strategize about Education. Actually, it might have to be one because whatever we decide to do is going to come from your body, your your group, your meeting, and we would vote on it as a full commission. Yeah. So you would have to have a public meeting. You would mm. have to request a public meeting for that. Just okay. because it would be uh, cra uh, crafting crafting things, and then all of a sudden they show up, mm -hmm. and they now become uh, something that's voted upon by the commission. Okay. So, all right, I can deal with that. But maybe Jen, you and I could figure out a date that we could yep. meet. Yeah, on. you could just let's just text her. That's yeah. the best way for uh, me. Actually, if you would send if you if uh you could email me about this tomorrow or later on. Yeah, once yeah. we figure out a date, we'll yes, email I will, you. I will I will get you you probably could meet in person in a, as a in a public meeting would probably be the easiest for that. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, great. Thank you. Uh, one thing I just wanted to mention, I did reach out to Doug McDonald. He's the uh, storm manager, stormwater manager at DPW. He's willing to come and give us a presentation. Would you be willing to entertain him in the first meeting of next month? Would that be okay with everyone? My but, only uh, question about that is there going to be enough time for the STO? Mm. Um, I, I, think, I think, Jen, that... Yes and no. It depends if we actually are able to put a meeting together between David, Sue, and myself before then. So if we don't have a meeting between now and the next full commission meeting, we're not really going to have anything to report to you. You follow what I'm saying? So I, I may, we may, we may not. Uh, and we may need more time to meet a few times to, to kind of distill the four different topics. That's just my personal thoughts. I, David and Sue, please weigh in um, if you think differently or... I'm, I'm kind of liking yeah, I, a presentation once a month. I think it's been actually really helpful. Um, yes, you know, I and, think and so. I mean, we can work as hard as we can, but yeah. hopefully we'll have more of a focused conversation about this with options, like Jen said, scenarios. Yeah, and please, um, anyone, if anyone has any recommendations of speakers, please let me know. I'd love to have some input. From others as well. I'm just kind of doing this by the seat of my pants, but it seems to be fitting into the um, our discussion topic. So, okay, does anyone else have anything else they'd like to discuss before we ask for a motion to adjourn? No, I just want to thank all the members of the public that came and thank them for their input and stay tuned. Um, we are going to fine tune this ordinance a little more. And I have a motion to sue. Um, I think yesterday was Rich's birthday. Happy birthday. Oh, Happy birthday. <laughs> That's not for public release. Now it's on, Sorry. <laughs> now it's on the whole world. Come on. Excellent. Worldwide. Oh, sorry web. about that. <laughs> I, just, I couldn't ask for a motion to adjourn fast enough. That's why I thought. <laughs> All right. oh, thank, thank you. Diane's got her hand up. Diane, where's Diane's hand? Where is she? I'm right here. Jen. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. I might no, no, apologize. It's I fine. This uh, is just a really quick question. When you guys get this ready to send to the city council for final approval and stuff, can um, I think it's really helpful if the public knows exactly what to say, because, you know, we get mm. a nanosecond at the beginning of the meeting. We can't say anything mm -hmm. after that. So we have to whatever we're saying has to be really concise and close. So if we can hear from the commissioner, like, what do you say? Um, I support and hope you move the blah, blah, blah forward. But I'm just saying, 
if you could make sure that in these meetings, what your um, objectives are, that would be really helpful when it gets to city council time. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does make sense. It's gonna go through multiple multiple public processes though, because it goes in front of the planning board and because it's a zoning change to the uh, zoning ordinance change, it requires public hearing okay. um, at the planning okay. board level and then it requires public hearing at the city council level. So All right, different. so I just said about the city council, make sure that we have that, that very succinct articulate thing okay. to say in front of planning and sustainability because okay. it's sustainability. All right, it's, uh, it's a great suggestion, thank you. Okay, thank you. All right, any, you. Other, any other questions? Going once, going twice, three times a charm. Can I have a motion to adjourn the meeting, please? I move to adjourn this meeting, uh, as Jen. Uh, second, please. I'll second it, Sue. All right, any discussion on the motion? Jackie, now's the chance to raise your hand. If not, no, okay, <laughs> all right. Um, <laughs> uh, may I have a motion? Uh, uh, all in favor, just raise your hand. We don't need a roll call. All right, fantastic. Thank you, Bonnie. Thank you for doing a great job with the minutes. We appreciate it. Thanks, Bonnie. Thanks, Bonnie. Thanks, guys. Thank you, Bonnie. Thank you.